Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to be talking about this little device, which makes playing music on my home stereo just a little bit more intuitive. I'm calling this the Stereo Control Interface, and before I talk about how I built it, let's look at the problem it solves. If I want to play music on the stereo, the first thing I need to do is come into the living room, grab the remote control, and turn on the whole stereo. This system serves the entire upstairs. We have a kitchen and a family room and a hallway and some other bedrooms, and this stereo really plays into all of those rooms. It's kind of an open house concept thing. So we first have to come and grab the remote, turn everything on, then grab the tablet, select what kind of music we want to play, and then play it through there. We use a uh, Sonos Zone player, which is kind of a whole house audio distribution type of thing. Um, it allows us to play Spotify, um, any music that's on the network, things like that through the stereo. So we can use the tablet or our phones to play music, but we first have to come in here and turn everything on with the remote control. So what I'm trying to do is eliminate the step of needing the remote control to turn everything on. So ultimately what I need is a device that listens for audio output coming out of the Sonos player and then sends all the appropriate commands to the stereo to turn on, set at the right input, set at the right volume level, and do all of that stuff automatically without me having to grab the remote control. The first step was to figure out a way to determine if the Sonos was playing music or not. On the back of the Sonos, there's a couple different outputs. There's two digital outputs, a coax and an optical, and then the analog outputs. The analog outputs are AC, so they won't feed directly into an Arduino. I tried playing around with the digital outputs a little bit, but they were a little bit more complicated. Um, I'd need some kind of receiver, chip, or circuit, and then a lot of logic, and I, I just really didn't want to mess with it that much, so I stuck to the analog side of it. Because of the AC signal that comes out of audio devices, I used some bridge rectifiers to try and rectify that into a DC signal, put that into the Arduino, read that. I used a bunch of smoothing capacitors, DC bias circuits, um, smoothing in software, and I really just couldn't get it to a point to where if a quiet song started playing, it would detect that as audio over the threshold of noise. It was just really difficult to do it that way. And that's probably more a result of my um, lack of knowledge of electronics than it is for this being the right way. But ultimately, I just couldn't get this to work the way I wanted it to. So I end up using this instead. This is the sound detector, aptly named, from Sparkfun Electronics. And this is a really simple little board that has a couple different functions. It has this little microphone on the end of it, and uh, one of the functions is you can kind of set a threshold so when you clap or if the sound level goes above a certain point, it actually turns a pin on. Then it also has this um, other output that is kind of like a volume output, if you will. It measures the audio signal coming into it, in this case the microphone, and it determines what level it's at, essentially, and outputs that as an analog signal that you can read into the Arduino. So that's actually exactly what I was needing for this application. I just didn't need it through the microphone. So I took the microphone off, and I also removed, there's a resistor down here, a link to the schematic down below. If you take out that resistor, it's five volts tied into the microphone for power. You need to take that off. Then you can run the audio signal directly from the Sonos into here and use this as your sound detection. So once I did that, running that directly into the Arduino, setting kind of a threshold value, it was just a matter of doing an analog read function in the Arduino. And when it got over a certain threshold, I could easily tell that music was being played. And if it was below a certain threshold, music wasn't being played. So that's the first step. The next step was to determine the best way to communicate these commands to the stereo. The main brain of my stereo is this Anthem home theater processor, and it has three main communication types. It has an IP-based web control, it has RS-232, and it has infrared. I didn't want to do the IP web control because that's a lot of software, and I'm not good at software. I didn't want to do that. Infrared would work. You could use an infrared transmitter to transmit to the infrared receiver on the unit, and that would work perfectly fine. But RS-232 is a little bit more robust because it's a direct wired connection with a DB9 cable, and the two are just wired together. And although I'm not using it in software, you could confirm commands back and things like that. So you could query if the unit is on, you could query the power level, things like that. 
I'm not using that right now in code, but it is a little bit more robust because you can get a response back from the unit that tells it its current state. So I decide to use RS-232. The Arduino doesn't natively talk RS-232 because it's a um, different signal level. So I'm using a SparkFun Electronics um, RS-232 serial converter. And it's just a little logic level converter that converts from the logic levels that RS-232 uses into what the Arduino can handle. The final piece is, of course, the Arduino. I'm using a Arduino Pro Mini here, and I've got it connected into an FTDI basically just for power. And then you can see over here is the RS-232 breakout that connects into the Arduino. And then I also have the analog outputs of the Sonos connected into where the microphone would plug into the sound detector board. And I'm just summing the left and the right channels because I don't really care about left and right. I just care about ground and signal for now. And um, you can see that pin 13 on the Arduino, the little um, LED right there, is off. That is because there is no music playing right now. So when I hit play on the music, you'll see this light turn on, indicating that there is a signal. And then also over here on the TX and RX, you will see a command being sent to the processor telling it to turn on, and then a command coming back, confirming that it was turned on. And there's a light, and there's a command. In a couple seconds, you'll see another set of flashes. Um, the processor takes a few seconds to turn on, and so there's another command that gets sent after that to switch the input. I've been using this circuit as is for about two weeks now, and it's worked flawlessly. It took a little bit of time to set the threshold level just right, but once I got that set, it's been working great. So this is fine, but I want to make this quite a bit prettier because it's going to be hiding inside the cabinet. So of course I got to make it look really nice. So let's take all this, put it onto a PCB and make this look really pretty. Both Amazon and eBay have a lot of these really nice extruded aluminum enclosures for pretty cheap. I found this one on Amazon, link down in the description, that had these matching PCBs that fit inside, so I decided to give one a shot for this project. If you're not familiar with these, they're really slick. They have these um, little end caps, and then the um, face plate and back plate are these metal pieces that just kind of snap into the rings, and then inside you have all these rails for mounting the PCBs, and usually the top or bottom or side slide out like that, and then inside we've got the rails. And so this would slide in just like that. And I got two different types of PCBs. Um, I got this one that just has every two pins jumpered together. And then this one's kind of more bust together a little bit. I doesn't really matter which one I'm going to use. I'll probably use this simpler one. I'm going to do female sockets on here so I can just plug in the modules. I'm really only going to be using about this much of the PCB because I'm just going to have the Pro Mini I'm going to mount the DB9 onto the back panel, and then I'm going to have the sound detector. However, this is not going to be the last time I make this device. I'm going to do some future modifications. I have some ideas of how I want to expand the functionality of this, um, volume control, input selection, make kind of my own custom remote, things like that for the future. So I will be using the rest of this space. Um, but anyway, these things are really cool, and it's a great way to make a simple project like this look a lot better, as you will see. Um, granted, I'm going to be using the CNC, and I'm going to be using the laser to fancy this up, but this is how I'm going to enclose it. So I'm going to start with the PCB and getting the components on there and wired in from the backside, and then we'll move on to doing the face plate and the back plate, and then we'll put it all together. Before I started wiring up the actual PCB, I needed to kind of get a better idea of the layout of everything. Um, I previously laser cut some ABS and I laser cut kind of a test back panel just to see where all the connectors would fit. So I took that, put the connectors on there, and that gave me a better idea of how I was going to lay everything out. And once I got the um, idea of where everything was going to go, then I started putting the headers down and then started plugging everything in and wiring it up. For the Pro Mini and the sound detector, I used female headers and then just put male headers onto the bottom of each one of those modules. And for the wires, I did pretty similar thing. I put male headers 
on the PCB and then I had some um, jumper cables that I cut to make, um, you know, basically female leads that would plug into the board. So, you know, it's pretty easy and it comes apart nicely, which makes for, you know, rerouting things or changing things around a lot easier. Here is the completed PCB. Put on a couple labels just to indicate polarity of um, some of the connections. And it is not the cleanest wiring in the world. I really hate wiring things up, so I just kind of, you know, did it quickly. But this actually works just fine. I'm going to end up swapping these LEDs out. I didn't realize that the only three millimeters I had were actually um, color changing. So when I test them, they looked red, but they actually cycle through different colors. So I'm going to swap those out before the final. Uh, now it's time to finish the enclosure for this guy. I designed everything in SOLIDWORKS and as I said earlier, I used the laser cutter to cut out some test uh, prototypes in ABS. So I know the layout's good. Now I just need to take the plates that came with the enclosure, put them on the CNC machine and cut out all the holes. I used a block of wood as a fixture plate for this CNC. This block of wood was bolted into the vise and then I used the probe to find the center of it, and then I drilled the hole pattern that corresponds to the faceplate and the backplate. So therefore, when I screw down the faceplate or the backplate into this block, I know where the center is. So then I can just run the CNC program to either cut the front or the back, and it was um, really easy to repeat because I could just swap in faceplates in and out. And I actually used some scrap aluminum to test this out a couple different times because I was testing out a couple different designs and it really worked well. Now I have all the pieces for the enclosure cut and ready to assemble. But there's one final thing that I'm going to do. With these anodized aluminum enclosures, there's kind of a little trick that you can do if you have a laser cutter or engraver. Now this can work with a CO2 laser like what I have, or it can work with like a one watt or two watt little diode laser or something bigger as well. The anodized parts on the outside of the aluminum can actually be etched off with a laser. You can't actually cut bare aluminum, but you can etch into it ever so slightly. And with the anodized um, coating on the outside, you can cut through that, etch that away, and then slightly etch into the metal. And it gives a really neat finish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these on the laser cutter and I'm going to cut out a piece of cardboard that is basically the outer frame for the face plate and the back plate, and that will give me a good reference point. So then I can just drop in the face plate or the back plate into that cutout and then etch it, and I know that the um, alignment is going to be just right because I just cut out the frame of the cardboard. So it's kind of an easy way to, you know, line everything up just so, and the end result is really great. It looks really neat, really professional, and if you have an inexpensive laser, it's a great way to just finish things off. And here are the two panels fresh off of the laser cutter. As you can see, it is nice and crisp, and I really like the look of this versus a silk screen. The other nice thing about this versus a silk screen is this really won't wear off or scratch off because it's actually fully etched into the surface. The final thing to talk about with this is the code. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I have a link to the GitHub repository for this in the description to the video. So if you really want to dig through the code, you can check out that. Essentially, the code started out as the smoothing sketch that comes with the Arduino IDE. That's what I use to gather the analog signal from the sound detector, smooth it out, get rid of the peaks and valleys, and then I test that against a threshold to see if it's above the threshold or below the threshold, and that ultimately determines if music is being played or not. From there, there is a variable that is either yes or no. It's a Boolean, so zero or one. And that variable is basically, did I already turn the stereo on or was it already off? And that variable is pretty integral because otherwise, every single time you read that there was music playing, it would send an on command to the processor. The Anthem has a couple little features. It has an auto off feature. So this device doesn't control any off. It only sends on commands. And it also has a feature that it turns on to a specific volume level when it turns on. So I'm not controlling any volume yet with this device. The, really, the only thing I care about is if this device thinks that the unit is off or no music was playing, if it goes from a transition from that 
to music now is playing, it sends an on command, has a little bit of a delay, then sends an input command after that. So it's relatively simplistic. And if things ever get out of sync, all I have to do is hit pause. That variable will toggle back to no music is playing, the device must be off, and then I hit play, and then it sends the on command and the input command once again, and all is well. And here is the finished stereo control interface. This is what it looks like from the front. There's a power indicator and an audio indicator to indicate that there's music being played. And from the back, it looks a little something like that. So let's go test it out. As you can see, I've got the device up here on top of the media cabinet. Eventually it's going to go down below. The power light is on, the audio light is off, indicating that no music is playing, which is correct. The rest of the system is off, so all I have to do is play some royalty-free music. This is going to detect the music being played. It's going to turn on the system, and after about 10 seconds or so, when this boots up, music is going to start playing. Let's give it a shot. There it goes. Thanks again for watching, and see you next time.